Salama porgy. If you are diving in the warm Mediterranean and spot this fish, please just look. Do not catch it, tie it to a stick, marinate it in lemongrass, garlic, shallots, chili, and seasoning. Grill it over a medium flame for 20 minutes until fragrant, and then enjoy, unless you're actively trying to summon your dead relatives. Here is why. This species is the Salema porgy, Sarpa salpa, a white fish with yellow stripes, roughly 30 to 40 centimeters long. The fish itself isn't venomous, but its strict vegetarian diet is the whole damn problem. Some toxic algae, like Calerpa prolifera, contain Calerpenyine and its toxic precursors. These toxins aren't broken down in the fish's body. Instead, they concentrate, most densely in the brain and intestines. Swallow that, and you immediately suffer hallucinations akin to dropping a strong hit of LSD. Not every Salema is toxic, only the ones that ate the bad seaweed. But you don't speak fish, so you can't exactly ask it about its daily dietary choices, can you? Just don't risk it. The ancient Romans knew about this fish's magic, reportedly using it at parties to get blissfully high. Today, however, health officials strongly advise against eating it, especially the head and guts. Your ancestors need their beauty rest. Please stop trying to call them. Mexican Tetra, Astyanax mexicanus. In the ink-black caves of Mexico, a fish species figured out its eyes were utterly useless. Over time, their eyes simply withered away, now reduced to tiny, rice-grain-sized remnants covered by skin, while their surface-dwelling cousins still sport bright, functioning eyes. This is the Mexican tetra. But this isn't a flaw. Ditching its visual system saves the tetra up to 15% of its energy compared to its sighted relatives. Plus, you know the drill. If God takes away one sense, he cranks the others up to 11. This fish is covered in hundreds of tiny sensory neuromasts across its head and body, acting as a living radar that hears water vibrations to detect prey or obstacles several meters away. They also possess phenomenal spatial memory, mapping the entire cave system in their minds, swimming so smoothly they practically know the shortcuts. They quickly became the pale, dominant ghosts of the wet Mexican caves. You can stop snickering about the blind fish now. You struggle to navigate two colored lines on a subway map, and this thing can mentally blueprint an entire labyrinth. Anglerfish, Ceratidae. With over 8 billion people on Earth, if you can't even land a date, don't even bother asking why anglerfish have such a bizarre, horrifying dating life. Down in the crushing, black abyss, where the only thing floating is microscopic, decaying flesh, any glimmer of light you see is likely the anglerfish's bioluminescent lure, a deadly neon sign for dinner. This species is unbalanced. The female can grow over a meter long, while the male is a pathetic, newly hatched shrimp, barely three centimeters. These males must possess an impossibly sharp sense of smell and needle-like teeth, but not for hunting. The moment it catches a whiff of a female's pheromones, it rockets in, clamping down hard onto her flesh. It then secretes a specialized enzyme that literally dissolves its own skin and jaws, fusing it permanently to the female. Now, it's nothing more than a grotesque, fleshy protrusion. All the male's organs degenerate, save for the testes, which pump out sperm. Reproduction for the female becomes ridiculously convenient. Whenever she needs to lay eggs, she has a ready-made sperm factory attached, effortlessly blasting clouds of fertilized eggs into the endless void. Oh, and a single female can carry up to eight such husbands. Antarctic ice fish. At the bottom of the Southern Ocean, where seawater chills to a lethal minus 1.9 degrees Celsius, the Antarctic ice fish survives with blood as clear as spring water, not the standard sickly red of other fish. This is because they have completely ditched hemoglobin, the oxygen-carrying protein in the red blood cells of most animals. Consequently, their blood carries a meager 10% of the oxygen that other fish manage. So why haven't they suffocated? because the frigid Antarctic water holds twice the oxygen of warmer waters. Beyond gulping down this abundant oxygen through their gills, the ice fish has shed every last scale, allowing their naked skin to directly absorb even more oxygen from the environment. This evolutionary masterpiece began millions of years ago when their ancestors got trapped in this isolated sea as Earth's climate shifted. Any fish that kept hemoglobin found their blood thickening, freezing solid, and killing them off. The ones who lost it had thinner, free-flowing blood, a major energy saver. To compensate for the low oxygen, their hearts are grotesquely oversized, up to five times larger than comparable fish, pumping blood four times faster through a circulatory system as vast and wide as a superhighway, with capillaries twice the normal size. They swim lazily and maintain a low metabolism, eating less to stretch their limited oxygen supply and to avoid freezing. Their liver produces specialized anti-freeze glycoproteins, effectively sticky glue that binds to tiny ice crystals, preventing them from growing large enough to pierce and shred their cells. The result? Their blood and flesh remain pristine and functional in death zone temperatures.
annual killifish. In the desolate, cracked landscapes of Africa and South America, where temporary ponds vaporize into arid deserts every dry season, the killifish has a frankly insane survival strategy. Their eggs simply hit the snooze button, entering a state of suspended animation deep within the cracked, desiccated mud. The process starts when heavy rains dump down, turning the desert into a temporary hell pool, murky, predator-infested water. Adult fish immediately launch into a few weeks of frantic, doomed reproduction. The female digs a small nest in the soft mud, lays hundreds of fertilized eggs, and then covers them with a thin layer of soil. When the water retreats, the parents simply die off. The eggs, however, refuse to. They develop to an early embryonic stage and then suddenly shut down. No oxygen, no water, no food, just special protective proteins in the egg casing that prevent desiccation and poison, keeping the embryo alive through months of brutal drought. When the next monsoon hits, the eggs hatch in a terrifying one to two days. Five millimeter fry immediately bolt out to feed. They grow twice as fast as normal fish, reproduce before the pond inevitably dries up again, and repeat the whole horrific cycle. Honestly, I always thought the three-body problem was a work of fiction. Northern Sea Robin, Prionotus carolinus, cruising the cold Atlantic seafloor as the Northern Sea Robin, striding around on six actual legs, looking exactly like what you'd get if a fish had a messy affair with a crab and carried the resulting pregnancy to term. Sure, fish are supposed to swim, but if a fish can fly, there's no rule against one deciding to take a damn walk. Technically, these aren't legs in the traditional sense. They're elongated, modified pectoral fin rays. But the unsettling part is what's on them. Tiny, scattered sensory bumps that function exactly like taste buds on a human tongue. This lets the sea robin instantly taste prey buried deep in the sand, locate it, and start digging. Pretty neat, right? Imagine walking into the grocery store and just touching a tomato to know if it's perfectly ripe. But, all right, that's 69. Here's your change, girl. Sand Tiger Shark. The Sand Tiger Shark patrols the coasts of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, bristling with jagged teeth, looking for a mate, and getting right down to business. A female can mate with multiple males, with sperm being deposited into her two separate uteri. And this is where the real horror begins. The moment the first pup hatches in each uterus, it immediately sprouts razor-sharp teeth and begins a cannibalistic feeding frenzy, devouring its siblings in a bloody, self-contained buffet. After the massacre, it sustains its growth by eating the mother's remaining unfertilized eggs, growing monstrously strong. By the time it's finally born, this single, dominant pup is already a meter long. So, if you have any social awareness whatsoever, please refrain from asking a sand tiger shark, how are your brothers and sisters doing?